really excited to be here. <laughs> um, welcome to Advanced 3 and 3 member training, Woo! as presented by Fiona Crouch in March 2010. <laughs> um, what we're going to be covering today um, is obviously advanced tactics. Uh, I will put out the disclaimer, it's incredibly difficult, I think, to teach advanced tactics. Um, Firstly, what the hell are advanced tactics? I mean, I don't know and I'm supposedly advanced, so that's going to make for an interesting session. But I've attempted to break it down, so this is an outline if you like to know where things are going. Any questions, just jump in um, as we go. So, let's start off with the basics. These are just rules that I think that you should live by in debating and should never, never be broken. So firstly, don't make bad arguments. That one's seems really obvious, but it's surprising the amount of times that that rule is not observed. And this is one of the first things I ever got taught when I was doing debating. Because uh, often it's easy to fall back and make bad arguments. So when I say bad arguments, I don't mean you've made an argument and you made it poorly. I mean, don't make stupid arguments. So don't make, you know, the most extreme and don't make a racist argument for obvious reasons. But then also don't make a really simplistic argument like this will lead to a slippery slope. Therefore, we shouldn't do it. So make sure that your arguments are more comprehensive. Don't make things up. For the recorder, I said things. Um, so don't make things up. It's really obvious almost all of the time when, the, when you do make things up. Um, and the chances are you will have someone that's done a PhD in your obscure lie um, who's judging you in an Austral's, for example, and they know that you made something up and it doesn't end well and you're always embarrassed. Um, the one time someone did make something up in a debate was not with my knowledge um, and my teammate got my other teammate and I to continue this lie and this travesty um, throughout the... Well, it was a myth. He, uh, <laughs> he basically made up a Jewish scholar. <laughs> <laughs> he, he told TJ and I about Natasha Abramovich. <laughs> Google Natasha because she's not real. Um, and he told us in the grand final of Adam, which we won, um, incidentally. And so we're standing up there saying, oh, what do you mean there's no examples? What about Natasha Abramovich? <laughs> <laughs> she's like a well-known scholar. She, and apparently like some generic scholar fits the description of Natasha Abramovich. So we didn't completely make things up. There is just, maybe the name's not necessarily that accurate. And he decided to tell us after the debate, which is good. So if you are going to make things up, which you shouldn't, but if you are, maybe don't tell your teammates until afterwards because they would make the lie more plausible. Um, the next thing is don't knife your teammates. So there will be times when you are in teams with people who you can't stand or who you don't like or who you don't respect who you want to kill, quite frankly, because often in debating, um, personalities clash, but in terms of debating personalities, they're quite complementary. Um, sometimes, when you don't feel that the dynamic within your team is particularly enjoyable, and I've been fortunate enough to never actually be in a team that I haven't enjoyed. Oh, actually, my first Oscars. <laughs> didn't like that one so much. But don't knife your teammates, no matter what happens. Even if they say something that you think is moronic, that you think is stupid, just ignore it as opposed to directly contradict it because internal inconsistencies look shocking. The next thing, don't laugh at opposition teams no matter how dumb they may be or appear to be. Um, and this is, I think, just a common courtesy. Firstly, I think we don't do this type of stuff at Monash and I think that now that you're becoming advanced debaters, you will start to notice that there are, there's certainly a style of Monash debaters um, and it's a style that I would urge you all to fit in with and to follow. And that's one thing is respect for your opposition team. So no matter, no matter how you know, confident they may be, whether they've won Worlds before and you, know, you think that they can take it, or if they're a first year and they're just saying something really stupid, don't laugh at something that they say. Because at the end of the day, it's just a debate. And even if you didn't care about their feelings, it makes you look like a complete ass and frankly not a very nice person. And people don't want to give debates to people that aren't very nice. The next thing is don't try and hide team members. So this goes back into... Um, what I was saying before, if you perhaps aren't necessarily that happy with the team dynamic that you're in, or if you, you feel that there's a weaker speaker, and I'd say that more often than not, there isn't, and that's just your internal per perceptions, and that's you kind of placing your own insecurities on someone else. But I would say don't try and hide team members. Deal with what you've got, be upfront about it. Don't think that you can just hide a speaker at second and no one will notice it, or put them at first and no one will notice them. 
Um, debating is a team sport after all, and you have to um, recognise that fact. Don't debate for a speaker prize. The reason why you shouldn't debate for a speaker prize is because <laughs> nine times out of ten, you won't get that speaker prize because um, how your teammates speak around you often influences your ability to be able to perform well as a speaker. And to get those high scores, it means you can get a speaker prize. And also because you're just a dick. <laughs> Moving on, always get feedback. That's feedback from the adjudicators and listen to what they have to say afterwards. There's been one time in my entire debating career, if you would call it that, that I didn't get feedback from an adjudicator. Um, and the only reason that that, what, that happened was because I actually would have punched the adjudicator if I'd gone anywhere near them because I was that furious. Um, so short of wanting to assault them, um, always go up and get feedback because even if you don't respect what they have to say, which you know shouldn't be the case because you will get adjudicated by really good adjudicators, they are your judge at the end of the day and you'll most likely see them again because the debating community is very small. So aside from you know having a charm offensive, trying to befriend people, um, it's also good to know how other people like to see you debate. Moving on. So before the debate, um, so I've broken this into topic selection and into prep. So in terms of topic selection, like I've got there, um, play to your strengths. So obviously when we're doing three on three, we get presented with three different topics and you get to prioritise them one through to three. Three being your veto, one being the one you most want to do. I'll like say it up front, generally you will debate that second debate. So it's important to always be able to actually debate that second debate and most likely be debating that second debate. So don't think that just because you prioritise something one and you think that they might veto something else and you've calculated so that the moons align at the same time and you will be debating the perfect <laughs> debate, like it probably won't happen and you'll probably be debating that second topic. So firstly consider your strengths. Are you a team of arts law students that's really good, that are really good at um, generic moral debates about social norms and nothing really useful in terms of getting a job? Are you in that type of team <laughs> <laughs> from personal experience? Alternatively, um, you know, are you a team of commerce students and so maybe a debate about markets is something that's going to be useful for you and you should prioritise it that way. Also consider what the opposition strengths are. Now I would do this with absolute caution because often you won't know your opposition well enough to be able to do that. But for instance, if you're coming up like against a high profile team that you've debated a hundred times and you know that they're particularly good at a certain thing, then maybe you should rethink your prioritisation um, if they're going to be particularly strong on that point. Although I have to say, at the end of the day, in every big debate that I've ever done, it, we have always prioritised it over what we as a team want to debate first and foremost, and stuff the opposition will deal with that. Of course they're going to rebut you, of course they're going to be smart if you're at you know, an advanced level of debating, which all of you are. So that's what I would say about topic selection. In term, oh, also don't be rushed. Like Some teams like, like me will harass you and say, come on guys, like, let's get going, we want to start the debate. Like, don't get rushed by someone. If you're not ready to give your preferences to the other side, then don't let them bully you into doing it. Um, the next one, in terms of... Oh, sorry, I missed a point. Um, don't ask other teams for help. And this is something that I've noticed over the past couple of years, um, people doing more and more. And really experienced people and people that are great debaters and shouldn't be questioning their own ability. So a topic comes out and you're like, oh, shit, what? Like, I don't understand, like, what two of the words in that that topic even mean, I don't know what the context is, there is a tendency I've noticed to turn around and ask experienced people, whether they're debaters or adjudicators, oh, what should I run for this thing? What should our model be? What's this debate about? Aside from the fact that that's like blatantly against the rules and that often you will get penalised for that and judges are starting to notice that more and more and are following that up, it's just silly. Like you should back yourself and you shouldn't place so much like blind faith in another debater who isn't in your team to be able to decide what you should be doing then. So just don't get into the habit of doing that ever. In terms of prep, firstly, use your time wisely. So my understanding is that um, you, you all have done preps before. You've all like know the basic structure of a 30 minute prep for round three. You know, brainstorm for a little bit, talk about it for the overwhelming majority of the debate and jot down a couple of points at the end. Um, the, the two main things I want to say here is firstly, if you've gotten a topic and you've decided on which one you're doing and you have no idea and you go into prep and you're just sitting there and you don't understand what this debate's about at all, don't just sit there for the five minutes of brainstorming. Give your teammates a heads up. So, like, this is something I've done many times and I'm not ashamed to say that, where I haven't really known what a debate's going to be about. And it's happened with my teammates, obviously, as well. 
So tell them if you're having a mental block and use that opportunity as a team to take 30 seconds to put them on the right track so then they can be, be a productive member in that brainstorm. Otherwise, it's a waste of everyone's time. You've got a dud person effectively for five minutes or you know however long you brainstorm for, and that's a waste of time. I'd also, um, I'd also make sure that everyone's on the same page. So if there's a debate that's particularly open, so like the generic example is that we would fund the stars, and you don't know if it's about Hollywood or NASA, then you need to make that decision as a team early on what direction you're taking that debate in. That rarely happens, but I'd say that if there is a debate like that, you know, taking 10 seconds to just talk to each other about the direction is really useful. I'd also say um, be disciplined, but not to the point of stupid. So this means that if someone's getting stuck on a point, whether that's you or your teammates, then you need to um, acknowledge that you're getting bogged down at a point and that you need to move on. So it's important to always have at least one or two members of your team that are conscious of time and conscious of moving on and the need to develop second speaker material. And unfortunately, second speakers, and this is part of the reason why you know, someone like a Mitt's really good at speaking second because he can come up with arguments quite quickly while Tim's speaking, to use my own personal example, um, because you don't develop the second speaker material enough and then it's just kind of generic crap that you get out because you as a team haven't thought about it. It's really important to make the time in prep to think about the material that that second speaker is bringing out because it's not fair on them and it's tactically silly to leave material there that could be stronger and could be better developed um, up to the whim and the ability of your second speaker to do that while their first speaker is speaking. Are there any questions about that before the debate? Okay. Oh. Don't freak out. Like If you're against a good team, see it as an opportunity to debate a good team. Now, the only way that I really improved was through debating really good teams and getting my ass kicked from like, quite a young age. And it, it's quite seriously um, true. Often losing in horrific situations, as much as you might want to crawl under a rock and die, is actually good for you in the long run. Um, and so if you're against a good team, so if you see you know, we're against Sydney A, then don't freak out about it because... Uh, you know, increasingly Sydney A is scared of coming up against Monash A or whatever, or maybe Monash D. Um, you know, so don't worry about it in those situations. Okay, moving on. Shaping the debate, so case construction. So the ones I want to look at here are worldview, the clash, strength and steel, impetus, models, and coming up with arguments. So let's start with well, why you need to worry about case construction. This is where you can really, I think, take your debating to the next level. And this is something which you can easily actually teach as advanced tactics. So often debates, really good speakers can anticipate how a debate is going to play out. They can see where it's going to end at the end of the debate. Whether that's because they've done 100 debates so they've seen it before or because they have the kind of analytical insight to be able to anticipate where the clash is going to be. It's important to be able to develop a strong case because you have to defend that case through six speeches um, and two replies often. Um, and so at the end of it all, you don't want that to be um, a piece of rubbish. So important things to think about when you're developing a case. Firstly is this idea of a worldview. Now this is a term that you'll hear every now and then. Um, I don't know, there seems to be a trend in debating to come up with kind of terms like synergy and shit to describe what I think are quite intuitive things. But I'm going to use the terms nonetheless. Mm -hmm. So in terms of worldview... This is when you're developing your case and you're thinking about either what model to run or what the problem is, what the flavour of your case is, that you literally work out who you are as a team. Like, who is the person in the world or the political movement in the world that you are attempting to embody in the development of your case? And the use of knowing who you are in the world is that that will help ensure that you're philosophically consistent as speakers and in terms of the case that you develop. So are you Margaret Thatcher? Hopefully not. No, that's not true. Um, you know, are you, I don't know, like a neoliberal in a debate or something like that? Are you a hardcore, deep green environmentalist? And if you know who you are in a debate, that often makes it easier to not only come up with arguments, but to make sure you're not contradicting yourself. Okay, the next one, the clash. So this is also when you're framing what model to run or how to, how to phrase your debate. You consider what the opposition will argue. So this is like... Obvious in some debates, so a debate about legalising marijuana. It's like a harm minimisation versus, um, you know, like a protecting of the citizens. Those types of clashes are really obvious. The more debates you do, the easier it is to spot the clash and you won't even think about it consciously. And I think that's partly what's so hard about advanced training is that a lot of these concepts I've never thought about in a long time at least consciously. You just do them the more experienced you get. 
So I guess that's the upside because you guys are getting to that stage where you're not consciously deconstructing how to develop your debating. Um, so in terms of the cash clash, think about what they're going to run your opposition, what are the key themes in the debate, how are they going to interact, and incorporate that into the way that you phrase your points. So don't, don't phrase your points in isolation of what another team might say because then it just is absurd when they come up and then you often see like a first neg or a second act and you're like, oh, that's what the debate's actually about because we just had a speaker that only looked at their side. So view it as a big picture. The next one is my personal favourite and one that I do consciously try and incorporate, which is called the strength in steel. So this is where you anticipate the strongest arguments for the opposition and then you often make that the basis for your own particular case. Now this has been done um, heaps of times by a lot of really good teams and it's a really conscious tactic that good teams will do um, in debates. So an example, like the most obvious example, is using feminism in a porn debate. So when you think of porn in a stereotypical way, it's viewed as being damaging for women, it's anti-feminist, you know, it's a variety of things there. A really good team is able to use those attacks and use it as the basis for their case development. So we actually think this is good for feminism. We think this is a type of feminism, this is good for women, this is empowering. Kind of, you know, the train of thought that I'm going down here. Um, so try and use their main attack as the basis for your case. Often this is not possible. Like, and so it has to be appropriate, you know. And as with all of these tactics, don't just use them because you feel like using a shopping list of tactics in a debate. It has to be where it is appropriate. Another example could be um, the idea that child labour um, is actually good for children. Okay, so it's a counterintuitive point that you can use their strongest attack as the basis for your case to develop. Um, a really obvious um, and quite famous example. Oh God, this was ages ago. This was before my time. Uh, was a Monash team using um, the China's kind of craziness about Taiwan as the basis for their case. So they were saying that um, America should support Taiwan or something like that. Um, and the opposition's most obvious argument is China's going to go ballistic, literally, ha ha ha, pun intended. <laughs> thanks for laughing. Um, Good one. Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, so China's going to go um, crazy when America supports them and takes a side there. Um, and the Monash team in this particular debate used this as a basis for, um, to say this is why we have to act now before China has an increased ability to go ballistic or to, before they even get more antagonised while we still have the levers to influence how China's going to react. So they incorporated what is like the biggest argument for the negative team and effectively pulled the rug out from under their feet. And I think it's the best way to win a debate um, at the end of it all. Um, the other thing... The other point here is impetus, and this is something that Victor in particular wanted me to incorporate. Um, I think most of you in the room would do this naturally. This is just creating like a reason for having the debate. So it's not just a context. A context is where you identify why we're having a debate, what's happening, why this is even a topic, even though sometimes it's not obvious why topics are set. <laughs> What you do with an impetus is you look for trends that are happening, um, you look for a tipping point that's occurred, you look for some reason to act now within the context and to create that sense of urgency for your proposal or for responding to a proposal. Um, the idea of an impetus is most common in, in international relations debate. Um, so I think that nearly everyone in this room would just do that automatically now, but it's often good if you're a first speaker to make sure you incorporate that into the way that you develop your first speaking material. So, for example, um, TJ always had a set of four questions that he asks, uh, well, he's, he's not dead, he's still with us, that he always <laughs> asks when he's setting up a case. Um, and one of them is, why now? What's the urgency? What's the impotence? <laughs> True. What's the impetus to act? Awkward. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I did not highlight the four questions because I could not remember them. Um, one of them is why now, um, what's the problem, um, how are we fixing it, what's the justification? Those are the four. Okay, I could remember them. Um, so why now, which is the impetus, how, oh no, why now, what is the problem? So that's a more generic problem within the context. How are we doing it, which is the model, and then why are we doing it, which is the overwhelming majority of, well, it is our case pretty much. Um, just as like a comment, we always incorporated um, 
how are we doing it as just a short little insight into the rest of his content early on and up front, which we found useful. Hi. Oh, you're at Monash now. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> nice to have you. Um, that sounded sarcastic. It wasn't. But I'm actually really happy. So, <laughs> sorry, you missed the bit where I said I'm hungover without knowing why I'm hungover. I think the word is stupid. <laughs> okay, moving on to models. Um, oh, this is annoying. I can't see my notes on models. Um, in terms of models, what I've said here is detail and problem and solution. So firstly, I think less is more with models. I think that when you have like a six point prospectus, then it's a waste of everyone's time in the debate and it's not persuasive. So keep your models to two or three points unless it's a particularly detailed debate. Um, I'd also, um, you can use models in an aggressive and an attacking way. So an example that I can think of is the Austral's final where it's about um, and sorry, all of these examples are examples of me, for obvious reasons, um, and I'm sure there are many more. But the debate was about Palestine giving up um, their military in return for state ship, a state ship from um, Israel. What we did there was, um, and I think this was maybe a mitz idea, and it was a tack on at the last minute in prep, and it was a useful one, um, was acknowledging that there's obviously a big attack, so this was also a strength and steel, a big attack coming that would come from the negative team about... Um, Palestine's ability to protect itself from Israel. So as a point of our model, we incorporated a collective security pact, which would mean that lots of countries like the EU, or blocks like the EU or countries like America, would come to the assistance of Palestine in the case of Israel intervening. And for those of you that have seen that debate, I apologise, but it did um, play out quite importantly in that debate and it was a really strong thing that we could rely upon. So that's the next point that I'd make about your, rebuttal, your models. Um, don't forget that they exist and don't forget that you have one. Ooh, too good for this one. Um, <laughs> he's not even... Um, don't forget that you've got a model. Like, often people see model as a ticking the box type of thing and they forget about the elements as it goes on. A really good third speaker and a second speaker, but especially a third speaker, will rely on that model and remind the adjudicator of what they had there and why it was important and why it should be considered in the debate. The next thing is problem solution. So this is something that's a really um, well-known term. It's just when you're identifying the problem and the solution, so your model, make sure that they're proportionate. So if you're talking about like an issue of, um, I don't know, none, uh, none, knife, carrying um, in the CBD, you don't give, <laughs> oh my god, um, I wish this wasn't recorded, you don't give police the right to shoot on sight of anyone that looks like they might be carrying a nun or a knife. Um, so, you know, that's the most extreme, <laughs> it's not that funny, that's the most extreme example of a, a, a big gap between a problem and a solution, but it's important when you're constructing your case and when you're trying to respond to another team's case that you are mindful of that difference that may exist. The final point in terms of um, coming up with arguments is something that um, is probably the most useful, um, <laughs> is the most useful thing that I've ever been taught in debating and it was like obvious that I needed to be taught it because I had no idea how to come up with arguments and I was often standing up without anything to say, which isn't that different from now, I acknowledge that. Um, a way to come up with arguments is to firstly list who are all the stakeholders that are affected by a debate. So let's try and do an example now. So a debate about um, legalising um, marijuana. Who are some of the stakeholders in that group? The Mexicans. The Mexicans, yes. <laughs> so by that, I think you mean <laughs> drug dealers. Yeah. Not that Mexicans are drug dealers, but anyway. Um, stoners, so drug users. What, who else? Families, general population. I was talking about the actual Mexican okay, government. Okay, one at a time, kids. <laughs> so I was actually talking about the actual Mexican government. Like, oh. like they don't have control of their country. Okay, anymore. so governments. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you weren't being racist. Um, <laughs> just generalists. Um, Gemma? Okay, governments. Anything else we can think of? Families. Yep. The health system. Yep, the health system, maybe law and order. So there's a variety of stakeholders that you can come up with. If you are sitting in prep and you're like, oh, I'm actually not being at all helpful during this brainstorming thing, then maybe list every single group that you think is affected by debate. Um, the next thing I would do after that is to identify trends. 
So what are some trends that you see? So perhaps a trend in um, international relations is to um, not necessarily respect the right of a country over um, its borders, so sovereignty. Maybe there's a decline in um, sovereign integrity and those types of things. And see if you can turn that trend into a, a, at least, at the very least, a bit of analysis that you might be able to build an argument off when you talk with your teammates later on. The final thing I would say is, if all else fails and you can't come up with anything, prep what the opposition team is doing. Okay? And this is often something that falls to the role of third speakers. So in debates, say you've got um, your first and your second speaker kind of riding away in the final moments of prep. As a third speaker, take it upon yourself or force your third speakers to sit down and literally prep what they would run if they were the opposition and try and incorporate that either into arguments if you don't have them or more importantly into a, a broader case construction framework that we were talking about before. Um, that's a really um, useful thing to do in these situations. So are there any questions about case construction? Okay. No? Moving on. So making arguments. Um, that sounds really patronising. It's not meant to be. It's something that I think actually goes the more people debate. People forget the basics of making an argument and they don't bother to make them in a really sound and logical way. So the first one I'd say is about making counterintuitive arguments. So, I mean, we all know what counterintuitive arguments are. They're kind of the arguments where you go, what the, when you hear them and you don't think that they should sit alongside. So the idea that child labour is good for children, that's kind of um, intuitively not necessarily something that sits quite comfortable in our mindset. Um, the way that I would make a counterintuitive argument is to firstly start with a basic proposition. So what is, you know, what are you trying to prove here? And then secondly, to acknowledge that this is a counterintuitive argument. So it's almost a disarming tactic. Acknowledge that this is something that we don't naturally associate with or that we, you know, society doesn't generally accept. And that often makes that argument more persuasive because you're equipping, hello, you're equipping the adjudicator and you're letting them know what's coming up and you're also kind of undermining that um, opposition attack of, but this is just not normal. Like, we just don't talk about this ever. This isn't intuitive at all. So I think that that type of disarming tactic is useful. The next... Um, Point is very similar and morally problematic um, arguments. I couldn't think of a nice fancy name. That's what I mean by that is like cannibalism and like S and M and those types of um, private behaviours often that society has deemed repulsive or unacceptable. I love cannibalism and S and M. I mean debates about <laughs> and S and M. He's recording it, not joking. Um, I love debates about that because I think they're really challenging and it also doesn't require me to have um, a lot of matter, although I come to the debates with a lot of matter, I can assure you. You didn't get what I was making a joke about then. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, morally, let's not dwell on that. Um, so morally problematic debates like that, I think it's firstly important to be the most reasonable team in the room. To not get emotional, to not kind of cry, you know, about religion or about, you know, any type of general intuitive human um, reaction that you might have to a particular topic. Um, I'd also acknowledge once again that these things are difficult to stomach. FYI, joke about things being difficult to stomach in cannibalism debates, really funny. And you can use them in those debates. Um, once again, it's a disarming tactic. I would also always push the opposition on the why. So, I mean, you always ask your opposition why, and you always... Did you just eat yourself? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was caramel for the audio. Um, we always ask... We always ask... This is getting rowdy. We always ask our oppositions why in debates. Like, obviously, we're always questioning causal links. But it's particularly important in these debates because often the reaction you'll see is it's just wrong and we just don't accept it. And that's a perfect, perfect space for you to then go, well, why don't we accept it? Why is it wrong? And at the very least, you force your opposition to spend time justifying arguments which are quite intuitive and quite palatable, but a boom, yep, um, <laughs> in these types of things. The final thing is a personal pet hate. Um, and I'm just going to stand on my soapbox about it for a little bit. And that's assertions. I've noticed in Monash debating, in particular, more than any other institution, that we constantly say that's just an assertion. Okay, we don't substantiate why we think it's an assertion, uh, an assertion, an assertion. We don't engage with it in that way, and I think that it's really problematic when often our number one source of rebuttal is to just say, "Well, that's an assertion," and then move on. So that's something that I would personally like to see changed in debating. 
So firstly, assertions from the point of making arguments. So this is really basic, showing the causal links, showing the chain of events. When you claim that there's a slippery slope, set, you know, step out the, the slope, so to speak, so that you're not just claiming that there's a slippery slope at the end of it all, so that it actually is more persuasive when you show that the analysis is there in your material. From the perspective of rebutting, my number one thing would be ease up. Don't just say as your number one point of rebuttal, that's just an assertion that they didn't substantiate. Go on to actually explain why that's the case, or more importantly, why it's problematic that they're making those assertions. So that assertion might be the basis for an argument that they've gone on to make for five minutes that's the main point in their case. And so you knock down that foundation, which is kind of implied when you say that it's an assertion, but you make it more explicit. Um, Incidentally, I also think it's bad when people say they didn't engage on this point and they just overuse that tactic. And I know this is hypocritical because this is something that teams I've been in do it all the time and we always say, oh, they never engage with this point. But there comes a point when it's too repetitive to just say that they didn't engage with this, focus on what they did engage with and rebut that. So getting off my soapbox now, moving on to manner. Um, manners, I mean, I think something really difficult to teach. Um, so let's try and teach it. So firstly, in terms of tailoring your manner to a debate, um, ask yourself what type of topic are you dealing with? Are you dealing with a topic about landmines and like legless children and something that's obviously really sensitive and evocative um, and there's strong imagery there? Or are you dealing with a debate about um, you know, invading a country to protect a large group of people? And so you can jump, you can use that kind of moral incentive um, as a basis for your manner. So tailor your manner. I'd also say, you know, in a debate about the environment or economics, from my point of view, they're generally quite boring. So maybe spice up your manner a little bit to try and make it a bit more interesting for the um, adjudicator and for the opposition and generally for the debate. Um, I think it's also important when you're tailoring to consider what the opposition's manner's like. And I think that this is something that gets lost the more advice becomes to become because there seems actually a correlation, I'm not sure if it's causation, but a correlation between the amount of experience that you have um, and the way that you speak. So I, you get more aggressive and more confrontational and often more abrasive the more experienced you are as a speaker. But I think that um, at least Australasia has seen lately are quite calm speakers at times and whilst they can be aggressive, they vary their manner and they also tailor it to debates. So is your opposition, as will be the case when you're experienced people in your Easter's team, you know, uh, like a pack of really scared first years that are like crying after their speeches, maybe not the best opportunity to like be a dick. So don't be a dick in those situations. Um, equally so don't be patronising. Um, I'd also say, you know, are you against really confident, you know, Austral's champions, people that are quite intimidating or well known on the circuit? You know, to, can you tailor your manner to suit that? So maybe that is, you go toe for toe with them and you're equally as confident and you back yourselves as a team. Or does it mean, um, you know, you maybe contrast with their crazy hostility with like a nice reasonable tone? <laughs> which is not something I've ever done. So, <laughs> moving on to team manner. Um, this is something that is really useful when you're, you know, in teams for competitions. It's not just like a one-off in an eternal competition where you might be in a team for a brief period of time. So, firstly, is there a contrast between you as speakers? So, once again, I think that speaking becomes, uh, you know, it's homogenised the more experienced people often get and the best teams have a variety um, between their speakers. Um, so be mindful of that fact, you know, do you have someone that's the calm, logical person that develops the material? Do you have someone that's like the aggressive, like, bitch in the team that might be um, rebutting in a certain way? Um, I'd also, don't snigger, I'd also ask, um, do you have momentum in a, as a team? So does your team build up to anything? Um, and so often, I mean, I just remember seeing debates when I was younger where I've just like sat thought afterwards, wow, that was just like the opposition got hit by a ton of bricks. And that's just because the team was unrelenting in their attack on them and that they backed themselves and they're entirely consistent. So consider that in terms of your manner. The other thing I would say as a team is that it's really important to be professional. Um, so firstly, if you don't look like you should win, you often won't win. And that's, that's the case. You know, no one listens to someone that doesn't look confident in what they're saying. Equally so, no one listens to someone that's overconfident or not many people listen to someone that's overconfident in what they're saying, especially experienced adjudicators that you'll see more and more the more experienced you get as debaters. Um, you know, often it means like at the table trying not to talk loudly and it means not pointing or it means not laughing and these are things that 
I've been in teams and we've had to check ourselves to become more professional and more calm in the way that we've approached debates. And it hasn't always worked, but it's something I think that people should try and be mindful of. There's a next, another point there which is about individual manner. So this is kind of, you know, if we've been talking about manner for the debate, manner for the team, in terms of your individual manner, I'd firstly say, and this is something that we teach first years to debating all the time, make the most of your first 15 seconds and your last 15 seconds in a debate. And without fail, those are the most persuasive points in any speech because they're your first and your last impression. So make sure you have an introduction when you stand up and make sure that introduction doesn't go on and on and on. Okay, So you know, 45 seconds for an introduction on three on three is a perfect amount of time and you should aim for that. Having a conclusion likewise is important so that you're not you know, getting three knocks and like people are throwing things at you to get you to sit down, that you're actually ending on a persuasive note so you can emphasise particular points that you want to make. I'd also say in terms of individual manner, um, and I don't think this is ever conscious, um, but something we should all be mindful of, is not to copy how other people speak. And so I think that there are a few people that sit down and think, I want to debate like, you know, I won't name anyone, X person in debating because I find them really persuasive. Because their manner suits them as a debater, the way that they think, how they look, how they, you know, deliver their material in these situations. So I think when you're taking a look at your own manner, be careful of the fact that you're not speaking like other people. And it's inevitable because we all speak with each other and we all learn from certain people. So there's like an army of mini, like, victors, well, not victors, army of little emits running around. I'm joking, obviously. There are an army of little victors. He just paid them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that are running around, that are mimicking this type of behaviour. There was, I remember when, I'll get to you in a second, I remember when I was a novice um, that a lot of people were debating like Tim Sonrak. Um, and so maybe not many of you have seen Tim Sonrak debate, but it's incredibly aggressive, incredibly patronising. And I think that to debate like that, and it's very persuasive when he does it, but often you'd get like people that didn't have the goods to back it up debating like absolute jerks, and it just didn't ever result well. And that those speakers were at their most persuasive when they let go of that other speaking spark style and developed their own. Yeah? Um, this is just something, like, it seems a little contradictory to something Mitt was um, talking about. Like, he used to emulate debates to try and find his own style. Like, so how do you balance that by like, trying to adopt what's good about other people to put a spin on in your way? Does that make sense? I don't believe that, that is inconsistent. Um, I think that what he's saying there is that, say you speak really quickly, take note of a speaker that speaks slowly and paces themselves. That's different to speaking like that other person in its entirety. So, for example, um, like I have similar mannerisms to Liz Sheargold because she coached me, but I don't mimic Liz's entire manner because that would look really weird on me. Um, because <laughs> she's like really nice and I'm not. Um, so it would look odd. I think that's what... That's why those two aren't inconsistent because Amit's saying, you know, if you've noticed that someone's really good at the first 15 seconds of being really persuasive or if you like the way, maybe not for this style, but they respond to points of information, adopt that by all means and it's good to see how other people do that. But then don't lose sight of your own personality and just become them. Does that, is, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. I think he's making a good point. Obviously, he's making a good point that it's good to take different bits from other people but not to become them yourself. Did you? Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, you can look at the way they make like individual arguments. Like sometimes people are most persuasive when they're making like quite moralistic arguments because they have a manner that suits that. Yeah. So copying parts of that manner for arguments like that is also probably something. Yeah, that that's a really, a really good point. And I'll say it again just in case the microphone didn't get it. So what Chris just said is that. <laughs> what? Why is that funny? What Chris just said was that often people make particular types of arguments in really good ways and it's good to observe how they do that. So the person that I can think of is Amit, who makes counterintuitive arguments really well, and he's done it a lot, and so it's often good to observe how he can do it. Whereas other people are really good at making quite moral arguments. So like Victor, I think, is particularly good, I'm not just laughing your ego, he's particularly good at making those types of, you know, really difficult, unpalatable moral arguments up front, and I think that he's a good person that you can look to as an example for that. <laughs> Welcome, Victor. <laughs> Are there any other questions about manner? You know, it's like the obvious stuff as well. Like, don't forget the basic manner rules that you learnt. Like, don't stare creepily at an adjudicator for a long period of time. Like, no matter whether they're hot or, like, hideous and you can't stop looking at them. Like, just don't <laughs> stare at them heaps because it's really creepy. And also, you know, try and look around the room. You're not first years, second years anymore, some of you are second years, but you're not new to debating. 
You don't have to look at a point at the back of the room all of the time. You're getting more confident with your speaking. You can look around the room and be more persuasive in that way. You know, it's also not talking too quickly. It's also making, uh, you know, emphasising particular points. So, team dynamics. Um, this thing I think is as well um, something that's like a, a way that you can consciously look at your debating and how you improve it, but it's something you need to do as, an, as a team. Like, you just can't sit on your own late at night when you're thinking about debating, like coming up with like tactics for your team and like the perfect archetype and all these things, and then just come to your team and say, like, this is how it is, guys. This is a, literally a team exercise that I don't think a team that's ever done well has managed to avoid doing. So it's like taking a look in the mirror, um, for lack of a better um, description. So firstly, in terms of preparation, it's important to remember that it's not just about matter. Like, you can know as much as you want, but at the end of the debate, if you don't know how to um, download that information to someone else, then it's useless. So as good as it is to know facts, <laughs> maybe this is like reflective of my own absence of knowledge in a lot of areas, as good as it is to know facts, it's not the be-all and end-all in terms of ter team preparation. So you can divide, like you're doing economics, you're doing environment, but you need to have some type of bridging of that information. Um, debate as a team together. So that's really obvious, but often people don't debate as a team together before they go to a competition. And I think the more debate you do together as a team, the better you will be without doubt, just because you understand each other's um, you know, particular mannerisms and how you prep. That seems really obvious, but it's something that people don't do the more the experience that they get. Um, work out a speaking order. Um, now, I will like make the point that you should be prepared to change your speaking order if need, need be. So the team, like the Austral's team that I've been in, what, like three times now, we always speak like Tim first, Amit second, me third, but there have been times when we've changed that up. So, for example, I remember when I was at UTMR Austral's in the final round, like Amit just like didn't feel like he was on top of the content in this particular debate, and I'd done a subject on it, so I was all, all over it for once. Um, and so we made the decision for him to go third and for me to go second. Um, and so it's important that you can change it if you just don't think a speaker or if you don't feel as a speaker that you're in the right position to be speaking where you are. That said, I would try and work out a speaking order and rarely deviate from that because you develop the ability to speak as a certain type of speaker. I would also um, point out that try not to think that I'm a second speaker or I'm a third speaker while you're still relatively like in the early stages of advanced debating like even really like experienced debaters so i'm thinking of the example of um victor kieran and sashi before they went to austral's and they made the grand final at adenao they were kind of speaking in different orders and they weren't locked on how they were speaking so they might speak you know victor might speak as a second in a particular team but in a different team he might speak a first so be prepared to change that around and don't like you know i identify as a first speaker therefore i can't speak second because um, often it's not the best thing for the team. Um, I'm not having a go at you. Um, and, you know, often it's good to listen to what other people have to say on your team dynamic because it's easier to look out than it is for you to often look in at your own um, style. Okay, in terms of during debates, I think that the team dynamic bit is really important. So, like, it's literally teams that work together are better together, obviously. And so it's good to have that level of teamwork within a debate. I, I'm talking about teams, like, it sounds really wanky, but it's absolutely true at firstly in terms of prep allocate roles to people you know maybe this happens naturally like you don't have to sit down and talk about it but you know in a particular debate you know does x person work with the first speaker to develop their material while the other person does something else you know think about what your your fortes are and then do that in that particular debate in that preparation i'd also um during debates like learn what your other speakers' idiosyncrasies are. So maybe they like to have notes written down and passed to them. You know, so often we'll, like, Emmett and I be sitting in Tim's ear and we'll, like, just be crapping on and, like, getting, like, outraged by something that the opposition was saying, probably, like, needlessly so. And we're just, like, sitting there and he just goes, shut up and write on a piece of paper. And I'm like, oh, okay, like, I guess that's logical. So we have to write it on a piece of paper and give it to him. And then that was better for him because he had something. And he, had the, he has the uncanny ability to read someone else's notes and make a point from it. You know, conversely, I'm not like that as a speaker. I have to be told as I go so I can incorporate it into my notes. So work out how you as a speaker and how your teammates as speakers do that type of um, or work in those types of situations. The next point is frank and fearless, and it's meant to be advice, but I took that off because, like, that's wanky. Um, 
So frank and fearless. So firstly, I think you need to be honest with each other um, as teammates. So this doesn't mean you rip on like a speaker for ages and you're too honest. It means that you recognise what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are and as a team how you can work together um, to kind of complement each other. So this is whether you're commenting on your teammates abilities and weaknesses or whether this is you actually looking at yourself and recognising what you're not good at. Like maybe you're not perfect at everything in debating, shock horror, and where you can fill those types of gaps. Um, the final point that I'll make is about debriefing. So after debates, it's good to look at what went well and what didn't go well, or after tournaments especially, to look at how you as a team did or didn't go and how if you spoke together again, you would change that. So, you know, in lead-up tournaments, do that debriefing. Um, all of this stuff about team dynamics, I think is so important to doing well. This is something that, um, as a team, my Austral's team only did properly in the lead-up to the last Austral's at Monash. Right, where we sat down, we literally, and I've still got the piece of paper because I think it's kind of nice to remember um, how lame we were, um, where we literally sat down and we wrote down like what are the number one things that we want to do better in a debate and what are the things that are unacceptable. So what conduct is unacceptable or what do we have to do by you know, a certain time in most preps. And so we, we had that genuine discussion and it held us in good stead as the tournament went on. So we looked back on what we discussed and we said, okay, where are we placed in terms of that and how can we actually meet those expectations that we've created for ourselves. I think it's also quite good to have an expectation about how well you want to do in a tournament, like when you're debating competitively. So not like Easter's, because Easter's isn't about making the grand final. And I think we all know that because we don't go to other institutions where they might, you know, rank teams and it might be more about, and that's fine, like unis have different approaches and it's not like Sydney's doing badly. So obviously it works for them, but we have a different philosophy here, partly because the novices that come to Monash are much much more inexperienced than the novices that come to Sydney. So Easter's isn't about that, as a little side note. But maybe it's good if you're going to Austral's to say, look, we want to make sure that we win four out of our seven debates. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with having an expectation like that. You know, don't overinflate your expectation and go, anything short of a grand final appearance, and I'm like, never debating ever again, and it's complete bullshit. Like, have a realistic experience, uh, expectation. So, you know, I've gone into tournaments, like, and you often fulfil your own expectations. So, I've, you know, at, like, Wellington Austral's, we went in saying we wanted to make the Octos, we made the Octos. When we lost in the Octos, it was fine, because we were happy with how we'd done. You know, when we went to Utamara, it was the semis, and we were fine when we lost um, in that debate. And then at Austral's, we were obviously happy for, <laughs> <laughs> for reasons that I don't need to explain for the tape. Shut up. <laughs> I've mentioned it less than I normally do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I know it's maybe not consistent, but what would this apply to teams we do in any of minis, any any of the other competitions that we do throughout the year? I, I think a lot of people. There's no reason why when you form a team to compete at Mad Mini, at Adam, at Melbourne Mini, Sydney Mini, and any of those things, that you shouldn't actually approach it and actually think, why am I doing? You know, do I have goals mm. for this comp? Do a particular one actually approach that as a comp and do some of this prep and, and talk about some of those yeah. things there? And you can have different like expectations. Like your expectation could be to get like really pissed every night and like hook up with five people and then like just have fun with your teammate, but not in the hookup sense because that would be a very good team dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> and you might like waste large amounts of prep, which is never useful when you are debating. Um, anyway, so you can have different expectations, but you know my only point is that for Easter's, I don't think we should go in there thinking that we're cut and about like dominating the novices that we're coming up against and showing them who's boss. <laughs> Questions? Um, from the perspective of a debater, firstly, 
Um, I don't know if you were here when I said before, but I think that the, the beginning and the ends of speeches are really important, and I think we should try and bring back the conclusion because it does have a place in debating. What the fuck is with you two? <laughs> So, anyway, um, glad the tape's off. Um, it isn't. It isn't? No. Okay. <laughs> turn it off. You're the worst AV guy ever. You don't listen to me. Yeah. You didn't turn it off. Yeah, that makes me the best AV guy ever. <laughs> um, okay, so from a speaking point of view, firstly, make sure you have time for a conclusion. Um, so often when people do conclusions, they're rushed and they're half to ask. And... Um, they're just like a shopping list. So the second point I would make is, and this applies, I guess, from the perspective of an adjudicator, is to make sure your conclusion is actually interesting. So don't have the conclusion as, so I brought you A point, B point, C point, and that's why, blah, 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 which is what you see in DAV. You know, try and make it a bit different. So say, you know, what we, depending on where you speak, so if you're first, so I identified this problem and take them through kind of a brief narrative of what your speech has been like. If you're at second, you know, say your second AF or, you know, your first hit at first knee, maybe your conclusion is appropriate to remind um, the adjudicator of what their response has been and what your response is to the opposition's case. And as a third, obviously, it's a more holistic conclusion of where the debate's ended. Um, the other thing I would say is change your manner for the conclusion and force adjudicators. And there'll be some adjudicators that won't listen and they'll just switch off. Like, they're probably shit adjudicators. Um, to be honest, and like the more experienced you get, hopefully the less you see them. Um, but that, to try and like reduce the likelihood of that, I would change the manner in kind of the final moments. So, and you know, say things like, okay, let's take a step back and look at what this debate has been about, or look at what I've brought you, and kind of have those concluding, that concluding phrasing that makes it more obvious that you're doing a conclusion and that it's useful. I think we can bring that conclusion back. And I think that it's really useful and it makes speakers more persuasive and a lot more clear. The reason why I think people... I think that... Yeah, bring, are we making a group? Yeah, like bring back the conclusion. Okay, let's do that. Um, I think the reason why conclusions haven't been really... haven't had that much attention lately is because people do them poorly. And I used to do them quite poorly um, in BP in particular. So I think it depends on the format. In 3 and 3, I try and do a better conclusion than I do in BP. It also changes... Like, I don't think you always need a conclusion, depending upon where you're speaking. So, say your third neg in an Austral's debate, you've got your reply speaker, so you don't need it. But say your third app, you do, because you need to leave that lasting impression um, to hold you over during that, that neg block. Is there anyone here that doesn't know what I'm talking about when I talk about replies and neg blocks and things like that? Like, it's fine if you don't. Just, okay, why well, aren't you all smart? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, are there any other questions? Maybe it's a good opportunity just to talk about things that frustrate you about debates or adjudicators or, I don't know, life. What do you do when you have a minute left in your speech and nothing to say? Mm, that's always a dilemma. Obviously, the first thing is to try not to have a minute left when you've got nothing to say. Um, I would... My... As a debater... This, I just finish early, I try and fake it. Well, that's what I'm saying. As a debater... <laughs> I'm hoping the tape was on. It was on. The question from the floor was whether it's better to finish early or try and fake it. Um, um, it's funny. This is where... This is where, as um, a debater and adjudicator, my opinion differs. So as a debater... My desire is always to try and fake it um, for the last minute um, and to try and make it last longer. <laughs> oh my god, how old are we? Um, I always try and do that as a debater. But as an adjudicator, I can tell you there is nothing worse than having someone just crack on and you're like, shut up, sit down, you've got nothing else to offer, it's really clear. And I think the adjudicator Fiona should win out because, um, you know, it's, they're judging you, not yourself. Um, so, no matter how embarrassing it might be to finish early, um, it's always better than to continue to go painfully for another minute. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that concludes Fiona's relationship advice. <laughs> Other questions? Dom the dominator? No? Yeah. You can, um, in terms of constructing a case for an exit, what do you think about running an entirely negative case? Hmm. 
I think don't do it. Okay, so so the question is about whether um, you can just run a straight negation. Yeah. So a straight negation is basically where you don't propose anything yourself, you just hang shit on the opposition, albeit in probably a very sophisticated way because you're all very advanced debaters. Um, firstly, in three and three debating, you're not allowed to run a straight negation. So it's in the rules that you have to actually propose something and that you just can't rebut what they say. You have to be cons positively constructive. Um, see ya. Um, in terms of BP, you can run a straight negation. I would also, like, I don't think I've ever run a straight negation in my life. And I just don't think it's worthwhile because it's not, like, it's not logical. And it always results in the response from the opposition, well, yeah, like, there are problems with ours, but what have you done about it or what are you proposing? So I would say as a negative team, it's perfectly fine to de defend the status quo. That is still running a constructive case as a negative team. Um, make sure you actually defend the status quo and not just say, we're supporting the status quo, show why the status quo is good and useful and we should continue to do it. Or alternatively, run your own positive case. And I think like defending the status quo is often the kind of least tactically sound thing to do because nine times out of ten, there's a problem that you're going to commonly agree on in a debate um, and you're going to acknowledge as a team, but if you then go on to defend the status quo, then you're left just saying, well, you'll make it worse, rather than, well, we've also added this other factor that's going to change this type of analysis that we've got in the debate. So that's what I would do. I wouldn't run a straight negation. I'd always try and run something positive um, in debates, because positivity is good. Any other questions? How does it work? Do you just rebut everything and don't add anything to it? Or? Yeah, pretty much. It's just, it's almost like teams just have forgotten to do it. Oh, like when you see it happen. and Or often you're just sitting there and it's you notice it a lot as, as a third when you're sitting there and you're like, ah, oh, like, yeah, they're like hanging shit on us, but what have they done about it? And it's always that's how you can identify what's happened. Um, I mean, often you can still ask that when people defend the status quo and they haven't actually shown why that's sufficient. Um, but a straight negation is where you just like go, here are my two rebuttal points and here are my three arguments as a as a first neg or whatever. So you just don't talk about your own model. Oh, okay. You don't defend the status quo. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? What debates are people planning on doing this year out of interest? Like who's planning on going to Austral's? We can stop it now. <laughs>